Good, good. Um, so I will uh, start the kind of the intro here. And this is our rough agenda. Um, <clears throat> we'll spend, I'll spend the first few minutes running through uh, some kind of introductory comments. Uh, then we'll switch gears to uh, kind of open mic community discussion. Um, and then <clears throat> we We'll spend uh, after that uh, at around a quarter after we will transition to our main presentation, which will be uh, Joey uh, walking us through uh, the deep quaternion networks paper. Uh, and then we should uh, wrap up on time at the top of the hour. Uh, in terms of upcoming meetups and announcements. Uh, First of all, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Joey for uh, stepping up. We had some last minute news that our schedule presenter for this month uh, wouldn't be able to make it due to a personal emergency. Um, and so Joey uh, stepped up, accelerated his uh, work and preparation, and uh, I am very grateful for that. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for that, Joey. <laughs> um, but uh, we will be hitting that presentation uh, next month. Uh, it's going to be David walking us through the Deep Mimic paper. Uh, and then in October, we'll be covering uh, active learning. Um, by all means, if you are interested in presenting a paper, visit the uh, meetup CFP, which is at twimlaicom slash meetup CFP and uh, submit your interest. Um, <clears throat> we are coming to the end now of our fast AI study group. We've got one session left. Um, <clears throat> and at the, at that session, we'll be talking about kind of what folks are planning to, to do to follow on. So uh, if you're interested in working with some folks to study uh, an online course, whether it's Fast AI, the, the second part of Fast AI, Andrew Wing's course, or, or any other, um, you know, let us know in the Meetup Slack. And uh, if other folks are interested in uh, studying that same course, we can help you get a group started. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of our, the main presentation, um, we can use Slack or there's a, a chat uh, in, the, in Zoom here. Uh, feel free to use either for Q&A. Uh, Joey, we won't expect you to manage the Q&A and presenting, uh, so you just focus on your presentation. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A uh, awesome. and I will uh, you know, interrupt you or, or wait for you to prompt for questions um, to uh, help get those questions in. Okay, I have a quick question. Is it going to be like a 15 minute slot or a 45 minute slot? Because I prepared like 50 slides. <laughs> no, no, 45, 45. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the 15 minutes is when you start uh, and then 45 is, is when we're, um, the way this is written is 45 is we'll transition to Q and A. It actually never works out like that. You have the 45 minutes and, and uh, you'll get questions uh, kind of interspersed. Okay. All right, so uh, it is five after, and now we will transition to kind of the open mic community discussion. Um, fair game here are any of the above topics. Um, you know, what any questions or comments you have or thoughts from recent podcasts, uh, any topics with or, you know, guests that you'd like to hear from on the podcast general thoughts on what you're working on or what's caught your interest, uh, interesting new papers or projects that you've seen or have been working on, interesting news items. Uh, you, know, what, uh, you know, what have you seen out there that is interesting? Who wants to go first? I can. So one thing that I kind of found interesting is 
is that the DOD is actually starting to pour in funding against some nefarious deep learning architectures like Deep Mimic. You said they're so starting to what? Pour funding into countering things like Deep Mimic. Oh, really? I haven't seen, I've been pretty heads down. And so I haven't seen much uh, news the past past couple of weeks. Um, but uh, are they investing in companies or are they building up teams to stand up those architectures internally? What have you seen? From what I recall, they're trying to invest in actually trying to counter those architectures themselves instead of going out into other companies. But I may be wrong because I skimmed it like a week ago. Okay, so kind of building up almost like a, an adjunct to their like cyber warfare groups, but focused on machine learning and deep learning? Yeah. Oh, uh, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Nick, I saw you pop in and out of there on, the, on your video. What have you been working on? Uh, you shared something in the chat. Yeah, I just shared a link. Uh, so I, I completed another machine learning themed blog post. Uh, this time uh, a literature review of some of the original papers for the different models of generative networks, uh, including the variation of all encoders, uh, GANs, and the new goal with one one convolutions. Uh, interesting. So what, what's your take on the GLOW paper? That came up recently and um, I did uh, uh, an interview on some work. Actually, I think it's a podcast that came out yesterday with uh, Izu talking about um, he's generating ground level imagery from satellite images in order to train land use classifiers. And one of the topics that came up kind of at the end of that discussion was he's hoping to look into this glow paper uh, as a and the kind of reversible GANs as a way to be able to process higher resolution images. What do you think about that paper? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I, I covered it mostly from an algorithmic standpoint. Uh, so like some of the downstream applications, I think so there's, I saw some explorations to do, but I, I try to just kind of uh, capture uh, the, the meat of the, you know, the, the algebraic applications, <laughs> but uh, Cool. Uh, Sinoth shared in the chat uh, a link to papers with code. Oh, interesting. So I was ju I just tweeted to someone uh, yesterday, uh, Emmanuel, that there was a site. I don't think it was papers with code, um, but there was a site that was maybe this or maybe they changed the name that I covered on the podcast maybe a couple of years ago like soon after I launched the podcast um, I was following this site uh, but I lost track of it and I couldn't remember how to find it. I um, think it may have been called like Distilled Pub or something. I remember hearing about it like we did like multiple times. It has like a bunch of Jupyter Notebook style research papers or something. The still, I think, is more, at least when I looked at it, it was intended to be more like an a online journal. Um, do they also publish, uh, they have some really cool visualizations. Do they also publish uh, code for the stuff that I've uh, journal? Yeah, I believe so. I'm on it right now. Awesome. Uh, what else has been going on out there? Anyone follow the, uh, the OpenAI uh, 5 benchmark? Tell any, us about it. Any Dota players? Uh, so I did an interview with, uh, with someone from OpenAI recently on this. So, oh, so Dota, this is their second, uh, <clears throat> kind of their second uh, wave of, uh, they've been doing ongoing uh, development of an AI to play this game Dota. Uh, the original set of announcements was, uh, was it earlier this year? I think it was earlier this year. They 
uh, did what they call Dota 1v1. So basically they uh, had a reinforcement learning agent that was trained to play this Dota uh, game, but kind of in a one versus a you know, one-on-one uh, type of fashion. But the actual game is designed to uh, be played five on five. Uh, and so they've since been working on updating their agent to be able to play this this game five on five. Um, and they did pretty well in this benchmark. Um, the I don't have the stats in front of me, uh, but there, if you look on their site, uh, OpenAI 5 benchmark, they have thrown so much compute horsepower at this thing. Uh, it's like they're, they are training this thing like some number of years per day um, on like hundreds of, what's that? 180 years per day, I think. 180 years per day on like some ridiculous number of CPUs and cores. Uh, it is just incredible. Um, and the, You'll be able to catch more of the detail in the podcasts, which should be coming out soon. But um, they've learned some interesting things about how, or they've made some. There have been some interesting observations about the strategies that the the bot has um, you know, identified just by playing the game over and over. Um, it is pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting. They this bot kind of found uh, strategies that humans uh, found over the years too. So that's uh, it's always interesting to see that was the same thing like in AlphaGo. I mean, this, this bot found strategies that uh, human also did and also found new strategies that human never thought of. And that was the same thing in this, uh, in this game. That's really interesting. I just skimmed on the blog post of the oh, non-technical blog post. It's really interesting. Yeah, there's uh, like one, uh, one example. So the, the, board for this thing. Basically, the object of this game is to kind of destroy the enemy's ancient, I think is what it's called. It's like their home base. Uh, and the board has uh, these kind of lanes that crisscross, uh, that crisscross the, the board. And when you start the game, I guess you're on your corner and you create these, these, I think they're called ghouls or something like that. And they tend to charge the other person's base. And one of the strategies that humans have developed is to basically, I think, ghoul blocking. Uh, if I don't think they're called ghouls, but it's something like that, or ghouls or whatever. I don't know, I don't play the game. But they basically, uh, uh, basically, if you let them run, charge the enemy too quickly, the enemy's too strong, they're all still in their base and they just get you know demolished. But there's a strategy that people have developed over time that you like just stay in front of them and block them for a while to let the game board kind of spread out and then you let them through. Um, so you're like creating an obstacle for your own, your own uh, agents, I guess, or your own, uh, these are like uh, the, you know, agents that are controlled by the game. So pseudo AI. Um, but anyway, you kind of, there's a strategy to block them. And, uh, OpenAI 5, you know, figured out uh, this, uh, this blocking strategy. And so one of the things that we talked about in the <clears throat> interview was the different types of um, training that they use and some of the different kinds of uh, features, uh, or not so much features, but like how they shape the reward function and the reward inputs that the reinforcement learning algorithm got so that um, they were able to train the, the agent to exhibit certain behaviors. Really, really interesting stuff. But the, the game was restricted this time, right? It was not a complete, uh, complete game that was restricted to some characters, I think, or? Uh, there are. Game, yeah, there are some character limitations. So uh, at the beginning of the game, you can pick uh, a certain number of characters. And I think the full number is, um, you know, different combinations of characters is in the hundreds or something like that. But there's some subset of the numbers that, that you can pick. Uh, previously, uh, if I remember correctly, previously, 
Um, and maybe at the benchmark, I think that maybe the benchmark was in this mirror mode, basically. So one person or one side picks its set of characters and the other side is set up to be the same characters. But I think they've since relaxed that, uh, that restriction. The, their next big uh, demonstration, I think, is going to be it's coming up soon, which is the, they call it the TI, it's the International Dota Competition. Um, and they're planning, I think they're planning some uh, updates or announcements around that. They will definitely uh, also win against the pro gamers. Yeah, I, I asked if they were, so apparently this TI, there's like a $40 million prize. And I asked if they were trying to, you know, compete for that uh, prize pool, but apparently they're not allowed to compete against yeah. Cool. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, pass the baton over to you, Joey. Uh, I apologize, I did not change this. It says quantum machine learning from our last time, but actually you will be presenting on deep quaternion networks. Yeah. All right, so uh, I stopped sharing and you should be able to share your screen now. Having some technical difficulties. Could have used Windows. Yeah, you know, take your time. You know, I, I forgot one uh, very important announcement that I should make, especially since Kai is with us at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, where are you located now, Kai? Are you in Germany? Yeah, Germany, Western Germany, yeah. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> we've had a bunch of requests over the past few weeks to create a, um, an alternatively timed uh, online meetup for folks that would like to join from Europe and other places for which uh, the US evening time slot meetups are inconvenient. Uh, it's two something in the morning in, uh, in much of Europe right now. Uh, and so Kai has stepped up and will be launching a, uh, a Europe meetup. Um, so we'll still be uh, online. You'll still be able to catch the, the videos, but for those folks that want to come together and uh, engage uh, live, uh, he'll, be, uh, he'll be hosting that. And the first one is going to be, what are the details? Yeah, on the first one, I will, I will present uh, capsule networks. So that's uh, the dynamic routing paper from Geoffrey Hinton. Jeff, Geoffrey Hinton, yeah. Yep. And um, so it's maybe not only good for people from Europe, but also from Africa, since it's in the same line. Mm -hmm. So if you're from Africa, you can also attend for a, a better time. And also um, for people in the US, it's, I think, at 12 or 1 p.m. or something. Oh, so not bad for us. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Better than better than for guys from Europe. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, so uh, Joey, are you all set up on your end? Yeah. Do you see my screen? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. We're good. <laughs> all right. So I pretty much made it in like LibreOffice on a Linux computer, all the tinfoil hat, and right now it's in a PDF format. So we should be good. I hear 2018 is the year of Linux on the desktop. Uh, I'm using Linux. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I repeat my life. All right. All right, so should I start? Yep. Floor is yours. All right. All right, so my name is Joey Lopez. I'm a second year transfer CS major at UCI. This summer, I pretty much decided to take a 16 week applied boot camp course here in Southern California where I'm located. And I'm on the tail end of finishing that right now. Pretty much, I started with no machine learning at the beginning of the year and just have been trying to learn as much as I can in my free time. So, for this particular paper, I'm going to be talking about a deep neural network that uses quaternion based algebra instead of regular algebra. 
pretty much, I had no background in abstract algebra or anything higher than remedial stuff until like a few months back. So it's been pretty much like a learning experience for me just going into that more like weird kind of math world. <laughs> so for this paper, I'm just going to be actually going over the history of how they were actually invented, what was being done at the time, their real life applications, like what they're currently used for now, like hardware and stuff. And then just the one the deep quaternion network paper, which pretty much has two, it pretty much does a segmentation and an image classification test using convolutional nets with quaternion based filters. I wasn't able to actually do much on the quaternion recurrent neural network paper or actually bring in other outside sources that I thought would be kind of interesting. So for part one, for what are quaternions? So pretty much a mathematician named Sir William Rowan Hamilton pretty much came up with them in the mid 1800s. In his line of work, he wanted to actually generalize complex numbers to higher dimensions. He initially tried to use triples of numbers. However, they didn't actually originally work because you actually need algebras with two to the n numbers instead because you can't actually normalize the different elements that you have too well. It's called a division normed algebra. So it works with like algebras with two, four, eight, 16, and so on. There's pretty much further generalizations, but as of right now, math pretty much is fairly well defined for four, for eight, and for 16, which are the quaternions, octonians, and sedenians respectively. So Hamilton's career. He worked in optics, dynamics, and also algebra. He had a fairly fleshed out career, but one day he pretty much came upon the realization for how he could actually generalize complex numbers into three dimensions. He ended up using four numbers, one real with three imaginary components to actually do it. So then for more background for what was actually being done at the time, vectors were initially thought of by a couple other mathematicians around that same time, but nothing like we know as linear algebra today was actually formalized yet. A mathematician named Grassman actually was able to generalize vector fields beyond 3 and 2D, and he came up with the idea of the exterior product, which is like the cross product but for higher dimensions. And pretty much his work along with Hamilton's work was formalized into what we know today as linear algebra. So then for examples for how it was actually used at the time, Clark Maxwell, the dude who pretty much came up with electromagnetic equations before like all the quantum stuff was well fleshed out he pretty much originally wrote his equations in a quaternion based format. However, he ended up changing them so that more people would understand the regular format at the time. So now I'm going to go into the mathematics of rotation. I'll first but begin by going through rotation matrices and Euler angles, which are the more conventional ways of actually expressing rotation. And then I'll go and give an overview of complex and quaternion numbers. So then for rotation matrices, so here's like some basic linear algebra. You have the dot product and the cross product, like the cosine similarity for the dot product and all that kind of stuff. Now for rotation in 2D, how it usually works is that you modify the basis of the actual vector space that you're working with 
by an angle. And you basically keep the basis vectors normalized. So that's how like it normally works for like when you're algebra and everything. And they're orthogonal, so there's like no shearing, no stretching, and everything keeps its proper shape. Now for 3D, pretty much those rotation matrices are generalized further in order to general, I mean, in order to rotate about each of the three axes. So you can see like the similar matrix, matrix right there in the bottom right corner. It's pretty much expanded in order to actually allow for rotation in the other three axes. So for complex numbers, they were originally invented to solve quadratic equations which involved negative radical numbers. So like rad negative one. And like the quick gist for how complex numbers work is that multipl multiplying a number by i pretty much rotates it counterclockwise by 90 degrees. Now for quaternion numbers, instead of just having i squared equals negative one, the algebra has a general rule that i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals ijk equals negative one. If you basically set the rational number to one and modulate the i, j, and k with trigonometry, the representation is homomorphic to a 3D sphere. And also, if you represent 3D vectors in quaternion form where the real part is imaginary, I mean, the real part is zero, the resulting quaternion multiplication is that the real part stores the dot product and the imaginary ijk components store the information for the cross product for it. And like right here in the bottom left, we can see like the generalized exponentiated form that can easily be used to provide a simple representation for how you can actually rotate stuff in the algebra. Now for why this particular kind of math is useful. So if you represent rotation with only 360 degrees, then you could encounter something called gimbal lock, which basically results in two axes aligning. When that happens, you can't tell if a rotation comes from one or the other axis. So this is supposed to be a GIF, but it screwed up, my bad. But basically what happens is that if you have your sphere oriented so it's x, y, and z, if you have the x and the y parts pretty much have their axes aligned, you can't tell if an orientation comes from one or the other. You would need like some external thing to tell you what to do in order to actually fix the mapping. A good example for how this kind of works. So I ripped this from a PowerPoint. I thought it was an ingenious example. Pretty much for the topology of it, you pretty much have like an imperfection when you have 360 degrees, whereas when you have like a 720 degree representation, it can easily become like undone and you don't have that kind of weird locking effect. It has to do with like topology and higher weird level math that I'm not too familiar with at this point. And so the example is if you twist the belt 720 degrees and then... That you can like pull it taut and it goes back to its original form, whereas for a 360 degree example, where for Euler angles, you pretty much have three of these where you only have one of the 720. Hmm and pretty much it just gets taught like that and it can't be undone unless you have some external factor. Hmm. And this kind of thing has real world implications for like implementing navigational systems and other things involving rotation and orientation.
Yeah, a friend of mine is working on, on inertial measurement units, and I think it's a more, uh, it's an easier way to calculate rotational orientation of objects, right? Yeah. So like, as you can see right here in the gimbal example, like when they're actually aligned, you can't easily tell. If you think of them as like reference frames and you go from one to the other, how it would usually work is you would have the three rotation matrices right here, and you would have them aligned up in like X, Y, Z, Z, Y, X, whatever you want. And then you would just update the angles in each one for how you want to actually modify the orientation of whatever you're working with. But when two of them align, you can't tell if a change comes from one or the other of the actual things that you're working with, the axes. Even though this is like a pretty representation to think of, it has that gimbal lock problem. So for applications for how this is actually used, so Unity pretty much hard codes rotations in a quaternion format, and it gives users the options to either use Euler angles on the front end or actually work in quaternion angles. So pretty much it allows for smooth 3D rotation, which is actually an idea that was introduced in like the 80s for video game graphics. Another... And so when you're actually using the quaternion uh, angles, are you still giving a, a three tuple uh, that corresponds to this i, j, and k, or are you giving something else? No, instead of saying that I want to move x by this amount of degrees, I want to move y by this amount of degrees, or z by this amount of degrees, you pretty much just have one angle representing orientation in 3D okay. for a sphere. Got it. So it's more compact representation. Mm -hmm. It's slightly more awkward to think about because yeah. <laughs> this, yeah, this particular representation, it's only true when it's normalized. Like that vector is normalized and you're using trig in order to just move the stuff around. But uh, by, be, by one, you mean one quaternion, right? Not one real number or something, but one. No, normalized. Like the unit vector would be one. Okay. And so the, when you're multiplying or when you're making this quaternion translation, that's your, um, your, as you multiply out your vector, you're still on this. Uh, yeah, you're still inside of the 3D sphere. sphere. Right. Once, if you use that normalized format and only modifying it by that trig. Yeah, okay. So, this is like the easiest way to actually think of the representation, but like it can be used in like other contexts and more deeper and creepier stuff, which the neural networks actually pretty much use. But this is just like real world applications right here. Okay. Any so other like, questions for uh, Joey while we're here? I don't see any on, uh, on Zoom. Is it the same like, like you would rotate a, a complex uh, number? So I just know this kind of when you want to rotate a complex or a vector in a complex space about 90 degrees, then you have to kind of multiply it with this uh, opposite thing. Is that the same thing for quaternions? Yes, I believe so, except instead of having like three matrices that you would be playing around with, you could only have like one four by four of real numbers or a two oh. by two with complex numbers. Okay, so it's a so four like by four. Yeah, okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. So like the representation is homomorphic to those two yeah. kind of ideas. So for aerospace guidance, I found this on another PowerPoint somewhere talking about the actual math. So pretty much, it provides for a more complex, sorry, more like compact representation because instead of having nine numbers to deal with, like these matrices right there, you can work with just four numbers. You can have basically a four by four 
I mean, a two by two of complex numbers to actually represent the quaternions for rotation errors and stuff. So it makes it like more resilient to perturbations or any errors for like navigation. So like I know that like aerospace, it's pretty much used for guidance systems in order to one, avoid the gimbal lock problem and to provide a slightly more numerically accurate representation for guidance. And I'm not too familiar with quantum mechanics at all like literally anything, but apparently the motions of an electron can be modeled with quaternion algebra fairly well. All right, so for part two, does it have to move on to the paper? Okay. All right, how am I doing on time right now? Uh, it is 36 after. All right, so the paper is called Deep Quaternion Networks. They pretty much go over the little bit of history, the algebra, their architecture, and just a bunch of other real applications like quaternion batch norm, convolutions, and just a bunch of other stuff with the architecture. Plus they do an image segmentation and image classification test using the KITTI data set and also the ResNet 10 and 100 benchmarks. So what they pretty much found is that with using quaternion algebra that they were able to actually reach similar if not better results than a real or complex net using four times, I mean, four times less parameters than the actual real valued or half as many parameters of the complex valued network. So in the paper, they develop quaternion convolution, weight initialization, and batch normalization. So for an introduction, I'm fairly sure that like everybody on this podcast is mostly familiar with like the concepts of batch norm, shortcut paths, and like residual networks in general. So then the motivation for this actual network. The ability of quaternions to effectively represent spatial transformations and analyze multidimensional signals makes them promising. Quaternions can be represented as complex groups for more robust and efficient mechanisms than can real or complex representations. That kind of echoes back to that navigational system kind of thing. Other networks have actually used quaternion based IO where either the input or the output was quaternion valued in order to represent rotations. Like PoseNet had quaternion output that it tried to actually use in order to cover six degrees of freedom camera poses from RGB images. Hmm. And it's also been used in signal processing in order to recover slightly more information than just using complex numbers and complex analysis. And another cool thing about convolutional filters that are quaternion based is that for real images, you can have the grayscale be one channel and you can have the RGB channels be the three other imaginaries with the mask in order to actually make it more transparent what's actually going on in the network. So it makes it slightly more interpretable. So in the representation for the algebra, there are multiple different ways that it could actually be worked with there's this four by four interpretation mapping the hypercomplex for quaternions to the reals. You can use complex numbers in a two by two matrix. And there's also calculus that actually works with quaternions themselves. I wanted to like actually bring in more information on that, but I just didn't have the time. So like imagine doing calculus and like backprop and all that fun stuff 
but in the actual higher level algebra rather than actually doing it in the reals. So then for their feature maps for the convolutional filters, they pretty much just divided them by four and assigned them arbitrarily to each channel, the real and the IJ and K. So is the, can you go back one slide? Yeah. Why is this a four by four representation used? It's, it seems kind of redundant. So those are just the real numbers of the, uh, of the quaternion, right? Yeah, it's pretty much mapping that algebra to reals so you can use regular calculus with it. Ah, okay. Like that's unavoidable. You'd either have to use this representation, the complex representation, or some arbitrary calculus or okay. whatever. So order it to work. It's because of this non commutative property? Yeah, the multiplication okay. is non commutative yeah. plus. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're trippy. So then for quaternion differentiability, here's a, like a Jacobian, for example, where they pretty much break up the real, the ij, and k. And this is pretty much an example of chain rule for it. Where if you have one quaternion that has a through d values, and you have a second quaternion that has m, n, o, p, like this is how like the chain rule would work in it using this representation right here. Like you'd have four matrices in order to actually do it. Like I know that this linear representation is used in like a lot of other things. Like I may be wrong, but I remember hearing back from like a YouTube video that like your cell phone, for example, stores orientation in like that four by four kind of format. And it just modifies those numbers in order to actually capture orientation. So then for the quaternion convolution. So convolving a quaternion filter matrix by a quaternion vector can be represented in this nice matrix format right here. where A, B, C, and D are real value matrices that are pretty much learned. And the cool thing about the quaternion filters is that they produce linear outputs based on each of the axes. So each of the axes of the images can basically convolve with each of the axes of the quaternions. So like the real and the RGB axes of the images actually convolve against the axes of the algebra itself and produce linear output. And so, so we used to think of uh, these convolutions as like filters. Is there um, a way of thinking about them in this quaternion uh, realm where you know, that's different, like we're doing rotations or something like that with the convolutions as opposed to kind of the typical filters that we're used to seeing in papers? No, they're literally like the same filters. It's just that you have more of them and it could capture interactions a lot better. Like normally how this setup would normally work if you just had a bunch of extra filters is that you would have like a single convolution on all those filters trying to capture interactions and hoping that it would converge to a, a good solution. Whereas here, the rules of the algebra kind of help nudge the model towards like a better solution rather than just having like a convolution on all the different filters. Yeah, that kind so of makes sense. And you need to add a grayscale axis in the first uh, in, to the image to have this kind of uh, restriction that you have four <clears throat> inputs. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or at least that's what they use in the paper. Isn't most of the time a grayscale just a linear combination of the RGB already? Yeah. I'm not too sure. Should be. Hmm. Right. So then for quaternion convolution, it's similar to a combination of like 
as we were saying before, standard and also depth-wise separable convolutions where you just have a bunch of the regular convolutions and then you just apply a convolution on all those kernels to produce a linear mapping. I mean, a linear interaction of the feature maps that you have. And the network's reuse of these filters on every axis may help them extract more information across the channels. And another thing, since the quaternions can be thought of as vectors, the kernels and feature maps of the quaternion convolutions can also be thought of as vectors as well. Now for quaternion batch norm. So for normalization of complex and hypercomplex numbers, it's not too easy because you have to invert the matrix that they're represented in. So like for the complex net, because it's just a two by two that's easily invertible. But when you're actually working with that four by four representation that they use, you're not always guaranteed an easy invertible matrix for it. I mean, it's not easy to actually deduce what the inverse matrix should actually be. So then they use an approach called Cholsky decomposition, which pretty much gives you two matrices is an algorithm in like linear algebra. That pretty much gives you one matrix that's lower triangular and another matrix that's upper triangular. And they pretty much just took one matrix from that and use that to actually whiten the, con the covariance matrix of the actual input. So then for the quaternion batch norm, the covariance matrix is given by this matrix on the top right, where you pretty much have the covariance for all the axes, the reals, the real, the I, and all that fun stuff. And as with regular batch normalization, the two per parameters, the shift, and the scaling parameters are learned. But in our case, with quaternion based values, the shift parameter is a quaternion itself, whereas the scaling parameter is a synthetic matrix corresponding to our covariance matrix. And since the covariance matrix that we actually deduced with this Cholsky decomposition right here, since the since the axes are independent, the covariance of it is the identity matrix itself. So what they did in the actual experiment for the test runs is that they set the diagonal matrix to one over two, one over red four, so that the modulus of the variance would be normalized. And we could see the formula for a batch norm for this particular kind of network right there. So then for quaternion weight initialization, they pretty much set it up so that there would be three parameters to actually work with. The magnitude of the actual quaternion itself and the two angle arguments. So in the normalized sphere format, pretty much the magnitude of those cosines is one because you pretty much have the quaternion normalized. And for the variance formula, it's e to the w squared minus ew squared. But because w is symmetric because of the Cholinsky decomposition and its covariance is the identity matrix, it, the expected value of it ends up being zero. So it ends up being canceled out. So we only have to worry about e to the w squared. And they pretty much solved it by finding the PDF of a hypersphere. They pretty much, do you remember like triple integrals and stuff like that from calculus? 
So instead of three integrals, it would be four in order to actually work with all the axes. And they pretty much just took the derivative of that and assuming that all the values are normally distributed for the axes, they ended up just reducing that down to just one parameter sigma. And they followed the setup from another paper where the variance of the whitening matrix was two over the number of inputs plus the number of outputs. And they solved for a sigma. But in the case of ReLUs, they only had to worry about the number of inputs. And we can see the sigma that they solved for right there. So then for quaternion weight initialization, the magnitude of the whitening matrix can be parameterized by sigma according to that learned PDF. I mean that PDF. And the angle components phi and theta can be initialized according to a normal distribution between pi and negative pi in order to constrain phi. So the experiment's results. So then the architecture used three stages of repeating residual blocks. There are, however, more efficient ways to actually represent convolutions, but in order to actually compare the results with real and complex nets, they use this kind of batch norm ReLU convolution kind of residual block structure inside of the nets. So then for the first experiment, they performed a test on the Cypher data sets. And they showed that the quaternion nets required slightly more training because finding the batch norm for them was slightly harder. But they achieved slightly better results with four times less parameters. So then the Cypher 10 data set it's pretty much 60,000 32 by 32 images in 10 classes. And the Cypher 100 data set is the same thing, except the 100 classes are grouped into 20 super classes. So like we can see like for fish, there's aquarium fish, flatfish like flounder, rays, sharks, and trout. And in the experiment, they use six nets, three shallow and three deep, with real, complex, and quaternion base nets. So then the three stages of the networks for the shallow networks contain two, one, and one residual blocks stacked consecutively, and the deep nets contain 10, nine, and nine, respectively. And at each stage, the number of convolutions was doubled. For like the real shallow network, for example, it started off with 34 kernels and it doubled up to 64 and then 124. So for the parameter budget of the actual network, they pretty much just set it arbitrarily, but they pretty much use two times less filters in the complex net and four times less in the quaternion net in order to actually match the amount that were in the real network so that they can get a baseline for similar parameters in each network. So then for training, they use stochastic, stochastic gradient descent with nested momentum set to 0.9. They clip the gradients and they use a custom training schedule that was similar to one from another paper which used complex nets in order to compare the results with it. So then their results, the quaternions outperformed the real and the complex nets on both data sets while also using fewer parameters. The quaternion models took 50 times longer to train due to the computation heaviness of the quaternion batch norm. 
but both the shallow and the deep quaternion nets perform slightly better than both the complex and the real nets. Hmm. Now on the second experiment, image segmentation. You've got about four minutes. Okay. The KITT data set, it's pretty much used for driving cars for real world computer vision. It's a bunch of different size images all around 120 by 350. I mean, 1,200 pixels by 375 pixels. And they're pretty much labeled with integer heat maps saying how likely a pixel is to be part of a street or just not a street. So then they use pretty much the shallow architectures from the previous experiment. However, they didn't actually use striding in their convolutions and they didn't have a global pooling layer at the end because of budget constraints for their computational resources. The metric that they used was intersection over union. And again, the quaternions outperformed the real and the complex nets. The intersection over union metric, if you take the complement of it, it can be used as a distance metric in order for measuring sets, saying how well they actually intersect. Now for the conclusions. The Quaternion Recurrent Neural Network paper that I did want to go over, it introduced a novel backprop through time algo. It didn't actually use Quaternion batch norm or something similar to what this paper used. So it didn't complain about computational costs or anything like this paper did. But they were able to actually achieve similar if not better results than the baseline real network while using three times less free parameters. And for other representations, which I can probably include like a link to, there was one paper which actually used a different kind of calculus for quaternions that would allow for backprop and all those fun algos for optimization. They actually flesh like Newton's method and so that's great in descent inside of that calculus. Hmm. And on a final note, quaternions aren't like the only algebra that could actually be used for this kind of stuff. There's, I forgot what it was called, but there's a kind of construction that basically algebras that are two to the n can easily work because they can be division normed and you can get good representations where you can use trig in order to modify their angles and everything. And that field is pretty much called geometric algebra. There are some papers that actually go over neural computation using that kind of framework. But I didn't have the time to actually go over them too well. And that's it. Awesome. Awesome. Was there any discussion uh, in the paper around <clears throat> where these types of networks would or should be expected to outperform uh, traditional residual networks or was the implication that it was that they're, you know, broadly um, superior in, in <clears throat> performance? There have only been a few papers on this kind of Clifford algebra kind of subject, but from what I can tell, imagine if you have something like differentiable architecture search and you're constricted on how many parameters you want your network to actually use. If you use a representation like this, you can probably have a more descriptive network. Or another possible avenue, imagine if you have like an embedded system that you wanted to put a network on if you don't care about training in the case of like this paper right here, but you're constrained on your memory resources, you can use like this kind of network and you can have a more descriptive network in less space. Mm -hmm. And the, the training is so slow only because of the, of the batch norm? Yeah, for this particular paper, the recurrent neural network paper didn't mention anything about that at all. It 
used some other techniques and it was able to avoid that penalty. Okay. But the highlights for this kind of field is that descriptive networks with fewer parameters. Like mm -hmm. that's pretty much the highlight. All right. Awesome. Any other questions for Joey? Uh, Zach, did you want to ask yours? Yeah, I guess I could ask it. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, something about depth by separable convolutions. So would you would you say it's sort of fair to see these as a special case of depth by separable convolutions? About what convolutions? Uh, depth by step convolutions. Did I understand correctly that uh, it's not just fewer parameters, but it's also uh, more accuracy in the classification tasks? Like, was there an improvement in performance? Yeah, they did claim an improvement in performance. However, I think that, like with all other things in this field, those improvements could be debatable or written off. They did claim improvements for both tasks, but the real amazing thing is just they achieved similar, if not better, results using extremely less parameters, 4x less, in the case of the image classification task. And I they assume you're getting comparable. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Like for the cipher data sets, for the, for the deep networks, for the real network, they pretty much had like. 4 million parameters, whereas they had under 1 million for the quaternion network. So like if you are constrained memory wise, that's where this kind of thing would particularly shine. Probably also interesting for applications on mobile phones. Yeah, like embedded systems in general, mm -hmm. which I haven't actually seen anything on. And did you address the question about the depth-wise separable convolutions? Oh, did I, that one? I did not. So in the paper, I wasn't actually too familiar with depth-wise separable convolutions before I actually read this a while back. So okay. pretty much, <laughs> they were pretty much saying that it's analogous to it, except that with the algebra, it allows the combinations to be more descriptive and slightly more straightforward rather than just hoping that you get good interactions with your convolutions. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I guess one of the things that's kind of stuck out to me during this is um, a lot of the sort of applications to quaternions are like about rotations in space, but yeah, um, like it occurs to me that the way they're being used here doesn't really sort of reflect that. Like, you know, the RGB grayscale input seems like a, I don't know, it's like, it is like a kind of a weird choice for an image when you think of it uh, for that case. And then sort of the thing that I was wondering about that afterwards as well, okay, you know, I tend to see that those channels as being the, well, channels of a convolution. So um, that are input. So for RGB, right, it's three channels. And then your yeah. next convolution layer could have 16 kernels or something. And that's sort of that same analogy. So it's kind of weird to me that it's like sort of limited to four or that it's not that it's limited to four, but that mapping does like sort of breaks apart when you get deeper. Yeah, that it's one. using four. Yeah, it is kind of weird. I just thought it was interesting because it provides for opportunities for slightly more transparent representations for what's going on inside of the network. So like I can imagine that this kind of stuff could be used for making neural networks slightly less black boxy. Hmm. Like there wasn't anything on that, but I just thought that that could be like a potential avenue. That's what kind of drew me to this kind of paper. Okay. Sebastian? Um, hey, yeah, you, with the four to one uh, parameter ratio of real to quaternions, I mean, a quaternion, if you, it, you're, you're saying in, a, in the real neural network, if you have four parameters, then in the quaternion, you would only use one quaternion parameter. But the one quaternion parameter has four real components in it, so. Yeah, it's just that sure it would be modified by one angle. 
Instead oh, it of, would be uh, one one quaternion angle. Yeah, to, that represents 720 degrees of freedom instead of just having like okay. all the images. But if you're using those matrix computations, then it would be four parameters on each of those um, matrix, uh, those you know, like unit matrix names. Yeah. I think okay. the, the question that Sebastian is asking is like this four to one parameter ratio uh, is that, you know, is that really one to one when you take into account that the quaternion has four components? I That's think exactly my, thank you, Sam. So yeah, go ahead, Joey. Like right here. So they pretty much just modify the angle phi when they actually take into account the quaternion. So they pretty uh, much, yeah. Like, so the angle phi is your parameter as opposed to your- Yeah, that you're rotating. R-I-J-K. Yeah. Okay. And then phi is pretty much mapped to I-J-K, which I-J-K is pretty much mapped to the four by four matrix, which is used for the convolutions right here. I know it's trippy. Yeah, trippy. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, like I this, think... Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Like this paper is pretty much my own intro to like abstract algebra because like <laughs> before this wasn't too math heavy and I just thought this was a good like stepping stone for probably getting more into that kind of stuff because like I've seen other papers that actually use like Clifford algebras for like support vector machines. Like there was one paper that pretty much used SVMs with Clifford algebras on like stock trading data sets where they had the vector fields incorporating time in spinner tensors or something, spinner tensors. I don't know how to say it correctly. <laughs> Interesting. I think uh, between this and Nick's presentation last month on quantum machine learning, we're going to have to stay away from topics that begin with Q for a few months to uh, <laughs> we'll let our brains decompress. But did I actually make it remotely approachable? I tried. <laughs> no, it was a great presentation. Okay. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very admirable to pick such a topic. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's very complex. Yeah, yeah so. like it's no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this generalization, they're called hyper complex numbers. Like, for example, the idea of supersymmetry. I don't know anything about physics. I've, I took physics, like a series of physics classes, like all the way to quantum at community college before I transferred like a year ago. So, like, super, super fuzzy. But supersymmetry, it could be captured by either octonians or sedenians like the 16 or the eight algebra. And like, you just, just think of it as how you can actually modify a tuple or like an array of numbers, except that you just say, these are the rules for how things interact. Like in the top right right here, this is a Hamiltonian matrix. So like basically for any construction you could come up with, if you can come up with a good matrix like this, you can basically come up with different properties like is a multiplication associative, yes or no? Is it commutative, yes or no? Like in this case right here, the multiplication is not commutative, but it's associative. But like in the octonians, it's not associative anymore. So like you lose properties as you go up, but you can make more and more representations. So, so pretty I much- find, I find that this complex and hyper complex number stuff is really, uh, it's Meta. very hard to understand when you tie this to any any application. Any application where it's used is very, very complicated. But it's in fact not that complicated when you try to find an explanation that is really just um, trying to explain how this works, for example, for vectors in a 2D plane or in a, in a 3D plane, then it's it's approachable. But when yeah. you kind of tie this to this, all this physics and, and uh, uh, electrical engineering stuff, then at least for me, it's very hard to understand. 
No, I think it's intentionally meant to be evil. But like, <laughs> the beautiful thing about this particular algebra, rather than like anything else, is that it does have those good analogies. Like when the quaternion is normalized, kind of like with the unit complex numbers, like e to the pi pi i representing negative one, e to the pi theta representing all the transformations on a unit yeah. circle. Pretty much if you do that, but with quaternions, you can get a 3D sphere. Yeah. So like yeah. that's the only useful representation you should think of these as. Yeah. But pretty much these were used up until like the 1910s or something. And they pretty much died out until like the 80s when they were brought in for rotational mechanics for like video games. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Um, well, Joey is on uh, Slack. So if anyone has any further questions, uh, you can uh, reach out to him there. Uh, and we're going to call it a night. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joey, so much for presenting this. Great job. No problem. Thank you. I'm going to come up with a few links to help people understand how this kind of stuff is actually useful. Like, for example, like quaternions and unity, for example. I could bring up a bunch of different links for that kind of stuff if you think it would be helpful for people to see. Uh, that would be great. And if you would also post your uh, presentation in the, um, in the meetup channel, that would be great. Awesome. Awesome. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.